Right, we're now going to go to Westminster. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the, the Palace of Westminster, which is uh, this part here, our Houses of Parliament, and then also the Abbey, which is tucked back here. Now, when you first look at Westminster, it looks like a sort of pseudo-Gothic building, I suppose. Um, and uh, I'm just going to discuss uh, why this form was chosen after the fire of the 1830s destroyed the much, much earlier medieval sort of ramshackle buildings. Um, here it is. It's, it's such a kind of familiar uh, silhouette against the London sky. Uh, so from the 11th century, um, early 11th century at that, it's the seat of um, English and later, of course, British power. The building that we're looking at is um, well, completed in the 1870s, and it's the work of Charles Barry, who also is the architect of that Downton Abbey, um, uh, Highclere Castle, I think it is really. Um, so I hope you can see the familiarity. And the Gothic revival uh, is very influential in not just literature with Walter Scott, but in paintings with the people like the Pre-Raphaelites, but also here, as in um, in this architectural style. It actually, when you look at it, is completely wrong for a medieval building. Medieval buildings, indeed, the old Palace of Westminster, was a kind of medieval hodgepodge of buildings that are organically built. You know, you get one built in the 11th century, another one in the 13th century, and so on. So that there is no kind of organisation, certainly no symmetry to it. So Barry is very cle cle cleverly looking at the kind of the, the classical ideal of symmetry and harmony. Um, and then his uh, great designer, Pugin, has added all the twiddly bits to give it that great outline. When I say twiddly bits, I mean crockets up here, which are actually the chimneys um, to heat uh, all the various kind of offices uh, within the building. And then over here, this is the Elizabeth Tower with the famous Big Ben bell inside the clock tower for Westminster. Tiny bit of history. Um, uh, so I've mentioned it's 11th century, early 11th century. Uh, the first uh, document documented palace uh, was built by Edward the Confessor in, in 1050. Um, the Abbey Church itself, uh, which you can see over here in the uh, drawing of the old medieval building, which is over here. So you can see what I mean by ramshackle and asymmetric. Um, Westminster, of course, means uh, the minster in the West. If you remember that uh, London, ancient London, is very much centred in the East, uh, what is now the East, the city, so-called. Um, major fire uh, in uh, 1512, the first major fire, uh, and all that res is resulting is the jewel tower over here, which is uh, where uh, Edward III uh, would have kept his plate and successive kings would have kept their plate and their magnificent wardrobe and so on. And uh, Westminster Hall, which is this building here, here in the old engraving, here in reality. Uh, built in the 11th century, but but um, uh, altered by Richard II in 1380. And we'll have a look at it in a minute. This is a, a Turner uh, watercolour of this terrible fire in which, you know, London has rushed out uh, on the 16th of October, 1834, to see um, the seat of uh, government go up in flames. The reason was the burning of these objects here, tally sticks. These were given when loans were made by the Exchequer, uh, when the loan was repaid, the um, uh, two bits of split wood were married up. And by the 1830s, there were stacks and stacks, I mean, literally stacks of these. Instead of sensibly taking them off site to burn on bonfires, they were burnt within the building and the fire was the result of that. So um, something else to think about, uh, uh, seats of power um, in modern democracies, of course, are often looked to Greece and Rome uh, for inspiration in their uh, in their design. For the reasons that I mentioned, uh, this particular kind of affinity with Gothicism, which was seen as an English style, if you think of English cathedrals and so on, it was, it, and so that was why it was selected. There was something particularly English about Gothicism, as well as this kind of general trend uh, to to um, uh, to this building style. Uh, Prince Albert oversaw the competition, which was won by, as I said, Charles Barry um, and Augustus Pugin. They the Gothic style, of course, also helps in incorporating the existing buildings, most importantly, the hall, which I mentioned that had been uh, refurbished by Richard II. Here it is. It's enormous today. Um, so goodness only knows, you know, in the 11th century to have something on this scale. It's where the late Queen's body lay in state. Um, Winston Churchill also got that privilege, Queen Mother. Uh, it was used for very famous historical events like the trial of Charles I, uh, the, the trial resulted in his eventual execution. 
Today, uh, when it's not used for kind of royal laying in state, uh, it's most often used when we have uh, visiting dignitaries who want to address both houses, the upper and lower house, because it has room to kind of accommodate everyone. So, you know, I mean, dignitaries like the Pope or Barack Obama or so on are, are, um, uh, are given this opportunity. Now, this is the House of Commons. Uh, so this is where uh, the two parties or the two main parties will oppose each other. So unlike, again, uh, um, other democ democratic um, uh, debating chambers, it's not the horseshoe. Um, it's very confrontational and it's really tiny as well. So the two um, leaders of the um, opposition over here and the prime minister, the government over here, will lean on these dispatch boxes. There's something called the mace, which um, is only present when court, when it's in session and the speaker sits um, over here on this chair. Uh, we have a saying called crossing the floor, quite literally when somebody changes sides, uh, political allegiances rather. Um, and uh, the... Um, building was damaged during the Second World War as a result of a of a bomb dropped by the Luftwaffe. Uh, and again, there was a discussion about, you know, redoing the, the, the chamber in this kind of horseshoe shape, more popular. And Winston Churchill felt it suited confrontational British politics uh, to, to be like this. This is um, the House of Commons. So this is for MPs in the government and it's green. Uh, for the Lords, the House of Lords, our upper house, it's completely different. It's all red and gold and so on and, and very, very sumptuous. We shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us, as the great man said after the bombing of the House of Commons. Now, Westminster Abbey, which is very near, is described as a royal peculiar, which means it's under the jurisdiction of the monarch rather than the Church of England. Um, it was uh, built uh, in the 11th century. It appears on the Bayer Tapestry over here because it is built by the last but one Saxon king, Edward the Confessor, who died before it was completed and he's interned. He is actually now a saint um, and has a shrine and more of that in a minute. <laughs> it's been rebuilt, you know, of course, by successive generations of kings and so on. But of course, it's most um, uh, notable now for, well, not only for the amount of burials inside of it, but of course, it's the site of British coronations. And um, I think there's a, a real handful, I think three or four coronations throughout the history taking place on a battlefield or whatever that have not taken place at Westminster. Uh, the very splendid towers were added only in the 18th century. Uh, they look um, like they've been there, you know, forever. <laughs> there's one Nicholas Hawksmoor. And um, above the Great West Door, there were these empty niches, which nobody could kind of work out how to fill them. Um, and then in the, um, uh, at the millennium, we get uh, the range of uh, uh, sculptures which celebrate Christian martyrs. So these are non-British uh, martyrs. Um, we have um, uh, uh, over here, Maximilian Kolbe, who was a Polish Catholic priest who died at Auschwitz giving his life um, uh, for, a, for a family. Uh, this is um, Grand Duchess Elizabeth, who was a member of um, the Russian royal family who was murdered by the Bolsheviks. She'd been noticed for her kind of saintly work as a nun. Uh, we've got Oscar Romeo. We've got um, Dr. Martin Luther King. So I think a really uh, a fantastic kind of embracing um, uh, decision uh, to, uh, well, number one, the subject, but um, number two, the fact that they are uh, non-British and some, you know, incredibly famous and then some perhaps not uh, less so. Once inside, uh, there's, um, you can see the coronation chair, which is used at, well, it's used, been used at coronation since uh, 1300. It's got this weird pierced gallery here underneath the seat that used to hold the Stone of, Stone of Schoon, which was where Scottish kings were, um, uh, 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 would sit on to be crowned. That comes to London in 1300, and hence the chair is made for it. Only recently, uh, in the last 20 years, has this returned up to Scotland. Um, it did come back for Charles's uh, coronation. Um, it's uh, got beautiful gilding. If you look really closely, it's got graffiti on the back where naughty schoolboys have sat in it and carved their names uh, in the 18th century and so on. Now, there are 3,300 burials within Westminster Abbey. Um, uh, they include uh, royalty, Queen Elizabeth I, Mary Queen of Scots is there, uh, great uh, 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 literary names, uh, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer has a tomb, Robert Browning, Newton, Hawking, uh, uh, 
actors like from David Garrick to Laurence Olivier, um, and uh, those that aren't buried in the cathedral, who are great Brits, are remembered by um, memorials. So, for example, William Shakespeare is buried in his hometown of Stratford, but he has this wonderful monument. There was also monuments to Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, of course. Um, and Oscar Wilde gets has a um, stained glass window we can see up here. Uh, some of the funeral monuments are absolutely spectacular. Um, my favourites are, I've just put it up here, well, obviously Shakespeare, but these two dear little um, children who were the children of James I and Queen Anne, um, who sadly didn't make it out of infancy. And I was always fascinated with this one, particularly as a little girl, because we've actually got a, a babe um, uh, in her cot over here. Queen Elizabeth I uh, on her great marble tomb. And then the most moving, of course, is the unknown soldier. Uh, this was an idea of a padre during the First World War um, who had seen a cross just saying soldier unknown. And uh, with the permission of the Dean of Westminster, um, out of four unknown soldiers, one was selected um, and uh, buried with great kind of pomp and uh, sobriety, uh, 11th of November, 1920. And this tomb is right by the West Door. So you, 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 this is kind of one of the first things you see when you come into the Abbey. Uh, traditionally, uh, royal brides leave their bouquets on the tomb of the unknown warrior. And the one I've got up here is Meghan Markle's.